So we have a long day ahead of us. Um, there's a lot of information to cover. A lot of terms you may or may not know. A lot of uh, workflow steps that you may have never considered or had heard of but didn't know really how to go about doing it. So I've broken this day into five parts. This is the first of the five parts. Um, <coughs> The first thing I thought we could talk about are why we image. What are our goals for imaging? There are a number of different reasons why we might want to do it. We may want to generate images to publish, either on the web or in printed publications. Maybe to allow researchers elsewhere to study the specimens, or you yourself to study the specimens while away from your institution. Um, to reduce the physical handling and thereby the physical damage of the specimens. Every time we handle the specimens, we look at them, we move them around, we run the risk of damaging the specimens, especially as they uh, get older. So by having an electronic copy, we might be able to see some information from the image without us then requiring us to go to the specimen itself. And that ties into species identification confirmation. Many times we're, we've keyed out a specimen, we don't know what the species is, and for confirmation we want to look at other specimens that are like it. Maybe it's enough to see images of specimens that are like it. Um, as we've learned throughout this course, to facilitate specimen label data capture, images can be very helpful for that. And then to to promote our institutions and what we do to the greater public, to the people within our institutions, help them to realize what is housed within our collections. Sometimes uh, pictures speak louder than words. From a different perspective, we could have <coughs> goals related to archiving. So this perspective is a little bit different than for access in that we want to think about a collection of images as, as hard and as cautiously as we think about a collection of specimens. Um, we want to capture, or we'll intend to capture, the highest quality images of these specimens to try and make them as close to duplicate digital copies as possible um, with whatever technology we have available to us. Um, and thereafter, we hope to save, manage, and maintain this collection of images across time as carefully as we would a physical collection. And that that incorporates the need to have to migrate the image file formats to newer versions um, to make sure that our image file formats do not go obsolete and we don't have the chance to migrate them to a newer version. And likewise, the same for the software programs in which we may manage those images. Uh, we want to keep things fresh and up to date. And along with that, we want to make sure across time that those images still, um, how do you say, the that the images are still images, that for some reason they haven't become corrupt or uh, un unreadable across time. So it takes some validation that the images are still present in your collection. And then finally we have goals with regard to photography and what we really want to capture in the specimen image. Um, if our intent is to capture the highest quality images as digital, copy digital copies of the physical specimens, there's some key things we always want to keep in mind and things we want to aim for. We want the specimen to be in focus. We want it to have good exposure. We want it to be white balanced. We want the text to be readable. And if at all possible, we want the image to be taxonomically informative. Um, so this first section of the presentation has a lot of terminology, but I hope that some of it's review for you. And I hope that you see it within the context of us um, solving or, or reaching those imaging goals, those photography imaging goals. So the first of those is, is in focus. We need our specimens to be in focus. Well, what does that mean? Focus is one of those words that has several definitions. One's like this flower is out of focus. So to be in focus, is the distinctness or clarity of an image or the state of being in focus, the distinctness or clarity of an image. And then in physics or optics, we have a definition where the point is, uh, is the point at which the rays of light converge, um, having passed through a lens or, or other optical system. 
So how does that relate to our camera? Why does that matter? Well, it plays into the focal length of a lens, which is the distance from the lens of the camera to the point where the light rays converge to form a sharp image on the sensor of the object that's out here. So we need that to be as crisp as possible. So it's very important to have the right camera paired with the right lens. How do we know? Well, each camera lens has a defined focal length or spectrum of focal lengths or, or between a high and a low focal length. So we need to keep in mind when we're deciding which equipment we want to buy, which focal length is best for our imaging workstation. Um, the shorter the focal length, like one of these shorter lenses here, allows you to have a wider view, which means the specimen can be closer to the camera. One that has a longer focal length, like a telephoto lens, would be able to capture and focus objects that are very, very far away. So you wouldn't want to capture a specimen up close because all you'd see is a very, very small portion of the specimen. So how, how well magnified is the object on your sensor? Tied into something being in or out of focus is, um, is alignment. We need to make sure that the camera sensor stays parallel to whatever it is that we're photographing. So if I have an herbarium sheet that's flat on a table and my camera is pivoted in any way, I'm distorting the image and it doesn't represent the true specimen as it's in front of me. And any scale bar I put on that specimen will not, um, will not be as true to a scale bar that's in the same plane as the specimen and the sensor. And please, if anyone has any questions or you need me to slow down, please don't hesitate to say. So all of those things tie into how we can get a specimen to be in focus. The next goal we would have is to make sure that the specimen has good exposure. It's well exposed. What does that mean? So again, exposure like focus is one of those words that has several definitions. It's, it's a noun, it's a, a state of being. So it can be the act of exposing the image sensor to light. So the image sensor at the back of the camera can be exposed to a lot of light or little light. So the definition can also be the quantity of light reaching that sensor. So what we call an image that's very dark is underexposed. One that's too light where we lose the details in the highlight we call overexposed. And one that's illuminated just right we call well exposed. And exposure is determined, uh, determined, determined by three factors. Three things come into play in the in um, the exposure. One is aperture, the other shutter speed, and then finally ISO. So, what is aperture? Aperture is the diameter of the opening here, the opening of the camera that allows more or less light to reach the sensor, and that's controlled by the shutter. When we're looking at a camera, we see that the aperture is often measured in F number. It's, it's referred to as an F number or an F stop. And although this is a little bit counterintuitive, the wider the aperture, the more light hits the sensor, the lower the F stop number. And conversely, the narrower the aperture, the less light, the higher the F stop number. So you have to try and remember to flip. Aperture is really important because it plays a role in depth of field. Depth of field is the distance around your object that is in crisp focus. So a wide aperture will yield a very narrow depth of field. So f-stop 5.6 has this, the object in focus, but everything in the background is blurred. Whereas a narrow aperture yields an image that has the background in semi-focus and the object in good focus. So the higher the f-stop, the narrower the aperture, the, the greater the depth of field. And then another, the other uh, part that ties into exposure shutter speed. That's the amount of time at which the, the sensor is exposed to light. Um, and we usually measure that in seconds. So this is another feature you'll see on your camera that you can manipulate. And it's measured often in fractions of a second because the shutter is very fast. But you can take uh, long exposed images at 30 seconds uh, and have uh, 
those are the images that generate water that looks like it's continuous as opposed to um, drops. So just like, uh, like with aperture, it's inverse in that the more time the sensor is exposed, the more light hits the sensor, the smaller the denominator, or a fraction of a second. <coughs> and then the third part that plays a role in exposure is the ISO, which uh, in the past, when photographers used film, had to do with the film speed, or how quickly the film uh, became exposed or its sensitivity to light, you could say. And although we don't use film anymore, um, the image sensor still um, reacts similarly to how film would, in that the lower the number, um, the more sensitive it is to light. Or excuse me, the lower the number, the less sensitive to light. And the, the finer the picture, the less grainy. And the higher the number, the more sensitive to light. Um, so if you were outside on a bright sunny day, you'd, you'd select an ISO of 100. If you were inside in a darkly lit room, maybe 400 or 800. So you'd need, in a dark room, the lens or the sensor to be more sensitive to capture all the light in the room. So we call this the exposure triangle in that each one of these three things is directly related to the other. So if you change one, the others have to change so in order to get uh, a well-exposed picture. If the others don't change, you won't have an opti optimally exposed picture. So how do we know if our picture is well-exposed? Well, we can take a look at it and guess that it's well-exposed, trust our monitor, trust our eyes, or we can look at the histogram. And the histogram's on, included in the camera, usually, or it's included in uh, image processing software. So an ideal histogram has nice peak near the end on the left side, nice peak near the end on the right side, but neither side off, off the edge. So an image is too dark when the histogram is pushed all the way to this dark side. So if you think of this as dark on a spectrum from dark to light, the more it's on that end, the darker the image. And uh, the opposite for here, for overexposed. So try and aim for exposure that looks like this. Now this, these high peaks here may not look like the histograms that you'll see when you capture pictures outside. And this is because the specimen is mostly white. The objects that you're taking outside or elsewhere will likely not be mostly white. So when you're taking pictures of, of botanical, excuse me, botanical specimens, we'd want it to look like that. Another goal we're aiming for is to have the pictures be white balanced and color balanced. What does that mean? So we want to make sure when we're taking our pictures or when we're processing our pictures that our pictures represent what we see with our eyes. So either the light in the room or the light of your light source or some setting on your camera, if it casts some unrealistic color, untrue color to what is your object, we can um, we want to change that or adjust for that to make sure that it looks like what we see with our eyes. So why, why would it be a different color than what we see with our eyes? Light is measured in, uh, in wavelengths and light sources of various wavelengths emit light in different colors or what we call uh, uh, how do you say it's it's warm or it's cold you could say it's actually measured in in uh, Kelvin which is a temperature so with regard to photography the type of light source will emit a yellow or a reddish cast or maybe a bluish cast depending on um, the wavelength of light so a match which we know emits fire, which is really yellow light, has a very low number. So the lower the number, the redder. Whereas, uh, what do we see? An overcast day, 6,500. I don't know what this is, clear blue poleward sky. But what we want to aim for is here right in the middle. So horizon at daylight, 5,000. Vertical daylight, 
5,500 to 6,000. And then color balance, which is a little bit different from white balance, has to do with the, the red and the green and the blue values that make up an image. Um, so we can adjust for that after the fact, after having taken a picture. <coughs> 